Good morning, Heritage Fellowship family and friends. Thank you for worshiping with us on this Communion Sunday. Each time we take communion, we reflect on 1 Corinthians 11 and 24, which quotes Jesus as saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And although we'll never walk the path that he did, we can all relate to that feeling of brokenness. To be broken means reduced to fragments, torn, out of working order, changing direction abruptly. I think we've all had moments, especially within the last year, when our lives abruptly changed direction and we felt out of working order. A trick of the enemy is to make us feel like nobody understands, like we are in this alone. But God is the peace, restoration, and hope we need. Oh church, now more than ever, we must hold on to our faith and hold on to each other. Our ministerial staff, Stephen ministers and lay leaders are here to pray for and with you and to support you in this time. Please send an email to lovelifts at heritagereston.org. You are not alone, and we pray that today's message will pull you close that you may feel God's love all around you. Let us pray. Dear merciful and wonderful God, we thank you for your loving arms all around us. We thank you for your hedge of protection that keeps us from the enemy's snares, God. We thank you that you have placed people in our church who will pray for us and guide us through challenging times, Lord. Father, we call on you right now to enter every home and every heart. God, that you may do a new thing in us, that you may charge us up, that we may be witnesses to your love and glory. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to be reflections of your light and love. We honor you on this day, Lord, and we thank you for all you've done and everything you're going to do in our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Good morning, family. Listen, I don't have many announcements. I don't wanna stay, stand in the way of worship this Sunday morning. Uh, this is Communion Sunday. This is the first Sunday of the month. This is the Lord's Day where we come to the table. I pray even now that you are making preparation for that celebration as we remember the, the, the meal, the lesson that the Lord taught his disciples as he shared in the breaking of bread and the lifting of cup is symbolism to what he would soon do on the cross. This morning, I just wanna give God praise. I wanna give honor, I wanna give glory. I wanna have a moment of thanksgiving and just share from my heart how grateful I am for each of you, for your cards, for your calls, for even being with us the other week when I graduated with my doctorate from the Colgate Rochester Crozer Divinity School in Rochester, New York. Listen, I was feeling down because it was a virtual celebration, but there were some that came together to just love really hard on us and it felt amazing. I'm so grateful that God gave me the favor. It was not any skill that I had in my hand, no, no brilliance that came from my mind. It was the grace of God that allowed me to pin what the Lord said. And I'm grateful that it now sits on the shelf and will be used to help build ministry and building up the kingdom of God. And none of that would have been possible without your prayers, without you traveling the journey with me. And so though I could not have everybody to enjoy the celebration together, I just wanted to let you know from my heart how proud and how honored I am to have completed this chapter and to have done it under the strength and the wing of your prayers. So this Sunday morning, help me to give God praise, honor, and glory for what the Lord is still doing in our midst. And while we yet celebrate that, won't you continue to give uh, our deacon in cares? They won't be deacon in cares for very long because at 3 p.m. this afternoon, we extend a movement in the life of the church where we come to ordain these seven individuals into the diaconate ministry. You ought to be excited as members of this body of Christ. One of the high honors of the church is when we come together in gatherings like this to be able to celebrate what the Lord has called, what the Lord has commissioned, what the Lord has laid his hands on and set forth to the task of ministry work. 
And I pray on this afternoon that at 3 p.m. would find you someplace in prayer, would find you someplace eavesdropping in to look in and to see and witness and be a part of one of the great traditions of the church. This is a pivotal time in our history, in our world, in the life of our church, in the kingdom building initiatives that we have. And I am so grateful, you ought to be so grateful, that the Lord has called and qualified seven to pick up the towel and accept the task. Please be in prayer. These are the announcements for the morning. It is a pleasure to be with you. Let's get into the heart of worship. Change, change, oh, 
The 103rd Psalm says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his name. I don't know what better way you need to get into worship on this Sunday morning except to realize that it's only by the grace of God that we have gathered in this house, that we have come together in the name of Jesus to celebrate what the Lord and the Lord alone has done. That's a good place to bless his name. And so this morning, beloved, I pray that you enter into worship with some thanksgiving, that you enter into worship with some praise, that you come together and lay aside whatever it is that you've been going through that together we might connect in the faith. It's in that place that I invite you this morning. Join me for a word of prayer. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. God, we bow before you as your creation. Lord, because we need to hear a word from you on this Sunday morning. So God, we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be alive in our worship. We pray for the visitation of your Holy Spirit to descend in this very room. That God, there would be no disconnect because we are virtually gathered, but that each of us would feel the power of your love conveyed through this word. Oh, Lord, our God, we ask this morning that this be the day that somebody makes a pivot, that somebody makes a U-turn, that somebody turns their life over to Christ. So speak, Lord, for all of your servants are listening. This is our prayer in faith. In Jesus' name, let those that love the Lord and believe in his word say amen. Amen. This Sunday morning. There's a word from the Lord I want to deliver that comes from the Gospel of John. Meet me in John, the third chapter. When you open your Bibles, when you pull up the app, you'll find these familiar words. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe If I tell you heavenly things, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's in that place this morning, I want to preach from the topic, you must be born again. You, you, you must be born 
again. The passage is easy to tune out early because it's become so familiar bedrock to our faith you know how it ends before it really begins. Probably the first verse of the Bible you ever learned was John 3.16. Come on and say it with me. For, for God so loved the world. There's, there's no clearer or more concise way for any of us to encapsulate the full breadth of our faith because it all hinges on the precept that God's love is established in the relationship between God and man through the gift of Jesus Christ. It seems so simple, but you really can't get any deeper than that. That the story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is to convince us of one truth, and that is that we might understand the depth of God's love. That we'd understand Christ paid the price for a debt he did not owe so that the sin that should have separated us is covered by the blood that has redeemed us. You think it's basic, but beloved, you got to get this framework because the scaffolding of our story is held together and never shifts uh, from the foundation that if it had not been for the sacrificial love of God, if it had not been for his body that was broken and his blood that came streaming down, if it had not been that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, we would not understand the power of love because we'd be lost in darkness. Can I put this on the plate this morning? You may not understand how he endured it, but you can tell quickly by our actions when you truly have had an understanding of the power of Christ's love. You can't be mean and hateful and say you received his love. You, you can't sit silent and see suffering in the world and not say a word and say you've received his love. It's, it's a woe unto us moment that we're living in, when the eyes of God are on his people, uh, when the fear of God no longer causes us to tremble, when the blood that was sacrificed for us no longer settles the matter, when what happens in the church, not the building, but the people, is a mirror reflection of the mess we see in our world. Anarchy in our nation, anarchy in the house of God, senseless violence in the streets, senseless vengeance in the house of God, when we're willing to rip at the core of the love mandate for one another as we seek to prove who's right and who's wrong, each willing to be a martyr for our own cause, but nobody willing to be a mirror of his love. When what feels right in our eyes doesn't match the model of Jesus we, we've read about in the Bible, something is so very wrong about our understanding of God's love. When the strife in our midst isn't settled by the communion that we share. When the word of God no longer convicts us and controls us, I wonder, beloved, do we understand, have we accepted in our hearts this one simple verse, for God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever Marcus believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Kelly, we sing about it. We put it to melody. But when will we allow the words to saturate our hearts? It's hard to be the church, hard to be the reflection of Christ. Can, can I make this personal? It's, it's hard to call ourselves Christians when we struggle to admit that what makes us family is that each of us, beloved, has had to humbly accept the gift of God's love. The only thing the world sees, the only words that ought come out of our mouths, the only thing that ought to flow out of our hearts is that each of us should be humble because none of us are perfect, each of us are guilty, and yet still Christ was willing to die for every last one of us. That ought to press pause on everything. That ought to slow us up lest we recklessly misrepresent what the gospel is all about. That the only thing that matters, what will capture the attention of those saved and those questioning what does it mean to be saved, is a humble understanding of God's love. Foundational to our faith is the understanding from the beginning the grace of God's love is fully understood 
in that he gave his son as our Savior. That's enough right there to make you rethink things in your life. That's enough right there to let wounds be healed in your heart. That's truly enough right there to repair every broken relationship. It'll turn a bad day into a good day uh, when you think about that God gave as an undeserved gift to fully express his love. I don't care whatever else you have in your life. You can have a Louis, but it won't last. You, you can have friends and they can fall away. You can have the title and your life still be empty. You can have everything you ever wanted and still be lonely and dissatisfied. If you don't accept that the greatest gift God has given wasn't materially made from the earth, it came down from heaven. John chapter three, if you reverse and rewind to the beginning, is about a man who seemingly had everything but did not know Jesus. In John chapter 3, we are introduced to a man named Nicodemus. He's only mentioned a few times in the Bible. John 3 tells us he's a Pharisee but gives no further description than that he came to Jesus at night. By his position, he's a part of the Sanhedrin. He's a part of the religious elite. He's distinguished and devout to the strict observance of the law, but he does not have relationship to make what he's read real in his life. He's, he's a Pharisee. He's got membership in the club. He's got the respect from the crowd, but he does not have relationship with the Christ. The Bible says there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus that came to Jesus by night. And if you give me a few more moments this Sunday morning, let me unpack that thing because it's easy to give the Pharisees a bad rap and not acknowledge that what made them troubling is not the trouble that they created, but the trouble, uh, but the true trouble of the Pharisees is though they were trained and lettered in the law, they had limited understanding of the Christ. Can I dig a little deeper? As students of scripture, they, they brought legalistic interpretation of the law to the faith, but, but they could not understand the one who was sent to fulfill the law. It was the Pharisees on the periphery in Matthew chapter 12 that Jesus and the disciples going through the grain fields on the Sabbath, hungry and plucking the heads of grain to, to eat, that say to him, Is, it's not lawful. It's the Pharisees on the outskirts of the same chapter, a few verses down, that sequester Jesus as he heals the man with a withered hand that asks the question, is it lawful? It's, it's the Pharisees on the perimeter in Matthew chapter 9 when Jesus goes into the house to sit down and break bread with tax collectors and sinners, but the blinded Pharisees miss the ministry moment and chide the dinner party with their words saying, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners. At every turn of ministry, there was a Pharisaic problem that attempted to limit God to the law, but never had encountered his love. For the Pharisees, their understanding of God was guided by two things, prayer and study of the law. As a matter of fact, that's the primary purpose why they built the synagogue as an obligated place of prayer. You won't find the word synagogue mentioned in Torah, but the primary purpose of the building is that it hosted the communal gathering, that, that in the synagogue, Bet HaTefila, the, the Bet HaKnesset, the, the Bet HaMidrash was the house of prayer, the house where we assembled, the house where we study. The house was so focused on the gathering, but the one thing that was needed in the house was an altar because you can gather as an assembly, you can gather to study and search the scriptures, you can gather to pray, but worship is incomplete, beloved, if there is no altar in the house to leave a sacrifice. He's not interested, God is not interested in the synagogue we create to worship him. What is worship if we withhold our heart from God, because worship is more than hands lifted up. Worship is more than a hallelujah that flies from your lips. Worship won't happen until something has been sacrificed on the altar. The Pharisees' primary concern was the protocol of prayer and the law. 
They, the Pharisees prided themselves in being overseers of the synagogue. But the synagogue could not save the people, though, though carefully constructed. The synagogue can never be a substitute. The synagogue is just a building. But Christ came, beloved, because he cares about the condition of our souls. Nicodemus comes to Jesus because he's seen the power of Christ challenge the authority of the stricture and the structure. He comes to Christ because he's seen miracle signs and wonders. He, he comes to Christ because folk that were sick and suffering are now in Christ set free. He comes because the folk that were excluded are now included. And he says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And in response, Jesus says to Nicodemus, the only way you can see the kingdom of God is you've got to be born again. Follow along. That's verse 3. Jesus says to Nicodemus, your desire to draw close to God, uh, but the kingdom of God you can't see. No matter how much you study, it will only have meaning. It will only be real when there's been a rebirth in your soul. Antoinette, this is a word for those of us stagnant in our faith, those of us who have studied, but somehow there's still something missing. Those of us who know the parables, but can't feel the pulse of God present in our lives. Jesus responds to Nicodemus, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. New King James Version says it like this, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot see what God is doing. You cannot inherit the kingdom he has established. You, you, you cannot comprehend the, the depth of his love. You, you cannot accept his sovereign will over your life unless you sacrifice yourself to be born again. I'm in the book this morning. Nicodemus belongs to a people who are faithful unto God because they've dedicated their lives to, to know every period and comma in his word. Uh, they're smart, but don't know what it fully means to be saved. Uh, you can't read this book and not have a clue of what it means to be loved. You, you can't clothe yourself in righteousness and not reflect the image that, that what bonds us together as believers is that none of us are better. None of us are perfect. We are all sinners saved by grace. I'm a sinner saved by grace. You're a sinner saved by grace. That each of us should be humble because our righteousness is like filthy rags before the sight of Almighty God. Nicodemus, you got to be humble enough to be born again. We throw that word humble out there a lot, but it, very few of us truly accept what it means to, to be humble means to be leveled low to the ground. Nicodemus, you can't worship God in your title. You can't worship God in the prestige that you have. You, you can't worship God being lifted up in self. The only way you can truly worship God is when you take all of that stuff off and get level to the ground. Fact is, too many of us like to be lifted up when our proper position before God is to be level to the ground. We like folks to esteem us, but if you're gonna live for Jesus, you gotta learn, beloved, how to be level to the ground so that each of us realize that the only way we can get off of the ground is to realize that we are recipients of God's grace. It's the only it's only on the ground that we understand what true worship is all about. It's only on the ground that, uh, that we understand, that we forget that we don't belong to ourselves because he picked us up and he turned us around. It's only when we're leveled to the ground that we realize that each of us stood in need, stand in need of a savior because he was willing to die. He was willing to die for you and for me. Nicodemus comes to Christ, but he's got to realize Christ is more than a religion. He's more than just the law. Christ is the only one that can save us and turn our lives around. Christ says to Nicodemus, you can't see the kingdom. You can't see what I've done unless you be born again. What truly troubles 
Nicodemus is that he's a Pharisee. Stay with me, beloved. He understands the law, but he hasn't been redeemed by love. He comes to Jesus at night so that nobody sees him, but he's got to take one step further and allow Jesus to come into his heart. Nicodemus may know about God, but until he opens himself to Jesus, he'll never spiritually grow. And I I think that's the challenge for many of us. We, like Nicodemus, know some things about God, but, but we don't spiritually grow. Can I meddle just a moment? If we truly understand the love of God, Why do we fight one another? If if we truly love God, why is it so hard to be tender with one another? If if we truly love God, why don't we forgive one another? If we truly love God, why wouldn't we break down every barrier to reach somebody and extend the love of God? In my study, God revealed the reason Nicodemus must be born again is because he cannot extend what he has not received. I fear perhaps we may be just like Nicodemus, biblically smart, but relationally lacking. Because to be born again means I understand his sacrifice. To be born again means I understand nothing that I've done deserves the grace that I've been given. I I understand because he's over my life. Everything has to change because I understand God's love. We let that term born again become a religious cliche. We use it as an air of privilege to symbolize to the world that we have been saved. But to be born again did not end when I came down the altar to give my life to Christ. To be born again happens every time I remember that he died. It it only takes one once to confess the Lord as Savior. But I wonder when the sun rises. I wonder when we get up out of bed. I wonder at the dawning of a new day, do we approach the day knowing that we've been born again? I wonder as we brush our teeth. I wonder as we look at the mirror in the reflection coming back at us, can we see that we've been born again? I, I wonder, beloved, as we make our way to work, before we press send on that email, do we remember that we've been born again? Jesus says to Nicodemus, your piety cannot save you. Your position, ah, it won't do anything for you. The only way to see my kingdom is you must be born again. Too many of us are too stuck in the flesh to realize the benefit of being born again. Because to be born again means I accept God has done something on the inside of me. To be born again means there are some buried things that that never should be resurrected again. To be born again means my life looks completely different. That The earnest desire of my heart is not to make a mockery out of his blood. Because to be born again means I accept that I didn't deserve this grace, but I've got it. I've got it because God gave it through Jesus Christ to me. There's, there's got to be a transformation that won't let me go. There's got to be a transformation that has changed my joy, changed my peace, changed my character, that was exchanged for my sins when he got up on that old rugged cross. Nicodemus, you can't live in the flesh and say you've been made over in his love. You can tell born again, beloved. You can hear born again, beloved. You can see born again. Because when you've been born again, you're not perfect. That's the, that's the life work of sanctification, but there's something in you that makes you crucify the flesh to conform to the standards of God. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And I pray this Sunday morning you won't harden your heart to the message. Ah, because the message from God is have you been born again? Be careful how you answer. Nicodemus had the knowledge, but what Christ wanted was the conversion. Many of us have the knowledge of Christ, but our lifestyles don't reflect that there's been a conversion. Something's got to change 
from one form to another as we come to the communion table this Sunday morning because the question the Lord asks of each of us is where is the conversion in your heart? The sad truth of many professed Christians is we have a whole lot of knowledge of Christ, but what he requires for those who seek him is, is there a conversion in your heart? And I stopped by this Sunday morning just to open up the beginnings of John chapter three, to ask you the same question that the Lord asked me, that the Lord ah, stated before Nicodemus, you must be born again. That beloved, you can get a makeover, but your life will never fully be made over until you surrender your flesh for the covering of his blood. It'll change everything about you, the way you think, the way you speak, the way you respond, the way you love, the way you show up in life, because you've been born again. We're about to celebrate communion in just a few moments. But I would not come to this table. I wouldn't sign off I log off this broadcast too soon. Because there's a question on the table for each of us, beloved. Do you fully know what it means to be born again? It's at that place that I invite you, quietly and humbly, to lay yourself before the Lord, to surrender your flesh by going to God in prayer. Let us pray. Sovereign Lord, ruler of all the earth, perfect in all of your ways. God, we confess this morning that our lives have not been a reflection that we understand the full depth of your love. God, this Sunday morning, we don't gather just for celebration, we don't gather just to feel good on the inside. We gather, God, to lay ourselves on the altar as a sacrifice before you. That, God, we would confess you as Lord over all. Lord, I thank you that while I was yet a sinner, you died for my sins. I thank you, God, that you loved me enough that when the sin should have separated us, you sent your son to redeem us. I thank you, Lord, this Sunday morning that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so, God, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you ride on the table of our hearts this Sunday morning. Knock on the door. Put a mirror up to our face. Speak in a way that we can't drown you out until everything about us is conformed to you. Our hands, our minds, our mouth, our heart, the thoughts that we think, Lord, we turn it over to you. And we pray, dear Jesus, that you would take this sacrifice and that you, O oh God, would cover us in such a marvelous way that when the world sees us, they will no longer know us by our former name, but that they would know us because we are your sons and daughters. For someone, oh God, this is a prayer of recommitment. For someone, oh God, this is a prayer of faith. For whatever, whatever road we take, oh God, to get into your presence, Lord, let us leave this moment forever changed. It's in the blessed name of Christ, our Redeemer. We give thanks. And we say, Amen. The Sunday morning, that prayer of invitation is for you. This Sunday morning, that prayer of invitation is for you. The doors of the church are open. As a matter of fact, they never shut. They're open for you to connect your life to Christ. As the Lord lays it on your heart, won't you reach out to us? We'd love to be family with you. 
send us a message to lovelifts at heritagereston.org. It would be our joy to walk this journey of faith together as one body in Christ. Beloved, this is the first Sunday of the month, the time when we honor and observe one of the two ordinances of our faith. The first being believer's baptism, this, the Lord's Supper. That we wanted to come to you this morning in the true keeping of how Jesus gathered with his disciples. It was intimate, it was personal, it was in fellowship one with another. And so this morning, wherever you are, whether you're around a table, whether you are in your office, no matter where you are, let's connect together in an intimate way as we remember and observe the Lord's table. Won't you share in the Apostles' Creed with me? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, he, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the church universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. For I have received of the Lord what I also handed to unto you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But, but when, when we, we are, are judged, judged by, by the Lord, Lord we, we are, are disciplined so that, that we may not, not be condemned, condemned along with, with the, the world. world. Let us pray this prayer of blessing together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, as we are prepared to come to the table together, the bread that we break this morning represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, bruised and battered, marred and mangled for you and for me. This cup that we lift represents his blood spilled on the cross of Calvary for the remission of our sins. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Come, beloved, let us eat this bread in remembrance of the Lord's body. Let us lift this cup 
in celebration that his blood has covered our sins. Amen. 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 Won't you pray with me this morning? Pray with us this morning. Lord, how grateful we are for the reminder that through your broken body, through your shed blood, that those, O oh God, who have confessed you as Lord and Savior are eternally saved. Help us, Lord God, to remember your perfect sacrifice for a sinner like me. Help us, O oh God, that we live this life, that we walk in this newness of life, knowing that by your love we have been claimed. That's the difference, God, that we pray that you ever keep before us as we strive to be a witness for you in the world. In Jesus' name, we thank you, God, for thank your you, God. free gift of salvation paid by the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. To your name be all glory, honor, and praise. Amen. Amen. Heritage, it is time to worship God with our tithes and offerings. We know that most of the work of the church happens when service is over. And during this time, it is critical that we have the needed resources to serve those who have the greatest need. We are reminded that we are to give not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. As a reminder, there are multiple ways to give. Visit our homepage and click Give in the upper right-hand corner. Use the Secure Give app or text to give by sending Love Lifts and your dollar amount to 703-337-3347. You may also give through automated banking and by mailing your check to the church. We thank you in advance for your gifts of love. Good morning, Heritage Fellowship family. I'm so excited to bring forward this morning to you our graduation announcement. You are in for a treat on June 27th. I want you to tune in to our 745 and 1045 services. Some of our graduates are bringing forth a mighty word. This year's youth ministry thing you may or may not know is titled Imagine Me. And this was really birthed out of our motivation and passion to make sure our kids see themselves the way that God sees them. So each month we have a theme. Right now we are in the Beatitudes. I am blessed. But guess what? In June, we are going to talk about I am victorious. Found in Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And I know that these youth are going to bring a mighty word. We're working very hard, so we need your support. And I cannot forget about the party that's going to happen afterwards. Anytime this D is involved, it's a party. So I want you to tune in. I want your support. Please make sure that we know all of our graduates. There's going to be some notifications that come out in your email. Stay tuned because it's going to be a treat. And I am rocking my Howard Stowe because I'm just in that moment right now. Be blessed. Thank you for worshiping with us and please stay connected. Join us for the Hour of Power on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. and daily for morning prayer. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Have a blessed week.